Well, good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you guys this morning. Let me, uh, as we begin to worship here, I want to, I'd like to read you Psalm 66. Psalm 66 says this, shout for joy to God, all the earth, sing the glory of his name and give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All of the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Well, this morning we have an opportunity to come and do that as well. To sing and lift high the the name of Jesus. To dive into his word together. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So let me invite you to stand with me and... uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll we'll begin to worship. Father, we just come before you this morning. We thank you for this time that we have here together. God, every every opportunity we have to gather and to fellowship and to worship is a privilege. Lord, I pray that as we are here this morning, Lord, whatever distractions we may have from our work week or from whatever uh, hardships that we're dealing with, Lord, I pray that you would take those, God, that you would put them in our our periphery, Lord, that you would center our focus on Jesus. God, that ultimately, whatever it is that we come bringing with us this morning, whether we're tired, God, whether it's some type of baggage, God, ultimately, the solution, the answer is Christ. And so, God, I pray that as we come to worship you today, God, I pray that as we dive into your word together, Lord, that that you would strengthen our hearts and build us up. God, that you, would, that you would draw us closer to Jesus. That we would walk with you and we would experience you in, way, in deeper ways than maybe we haven't before. So Lord, I pray your blessings upon our time of worship. And I pray that you would just continue the great work you're doing inside of our hearts and in our lives. So Lord, be with us here in these next few moments. Lord, may we magnify the name of Jesus. And we ask it all in his holy name. Amen. Good morning, freedom! Good morning. Let's worship together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Until I met I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you Then I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious name You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious name Now your freedom is all that I know The old made new Jesus, when I met you You call my name
needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven.
worthy of our praise, Jesus. We lift your name high and holy. You are the only one deserving of our praise, God. Let us hear what you have to say to us, God. Touch our hearts, open our hearts that we can hear your holy word and let it change us, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, good morning. Once again, let me invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. In the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, we have been continuing on in a uh, sermon series called The Heart of Jesus. And I believe that one of the most under-talked about and under-celebrated aspects of our faith that if we were looking at Scripture that, that we just simply don't talk enough about is who Jesus is at his heart. What is God's heart for you? That is a question that we have been exploring. Um, we often talk about the what that Jesus does for us. But we don't talk about the why, what's in his nature. And so la the last couple of weeks we've been, we've been looking at the, the fact that Jesus is both gentle and lowly in heart for us. We've also been looking at, last week David brought, brought us a wonderful message uh, talking about how Jesus is compassionate and generous in his heart towards us. Well, this morning we're going to look in Hebrews chapter 4 and we're going to see more about the heart of Jesus. Here's what I believe. I believe that human beings are created to be captivated by beauty. That we love beautiful things. We like beautiful artwork. We like beautiful people. We like beautiful music. We like, we like beautiful nature, scenery. We're captivated by beauty. And yet, there is nothing in the universe more beautiful than the heart of Jesus. That there is something unique. There is something glorious and wonderful and good that when we look at the heart of Jesus for us, we are encouraged and strengthened and built up by it. You know, naturally, we believe that Jesus is like a drill sergeant. He's like a, he's like a, he's like a, he's like a never satisfied baseball coach. He's like a, he's like a relentless, he's, he's like a relentless nitpicker of everything that's going wrong. That's sometimes what we believe about God. For different reasons, maybe past church experiences, maybe uh, maybe you heard something, or maybe uh, it's just a lack of being in the Word. We, so we tend to believe harsh things about God, but if we were to look at Scripture like we do every single week, we open our Bibles and we see the truth of the Word here, then we'll see the heart of Christ is good and it is bent towards us. That Jesus is drawing near to us, not pushing us away. Sometimes we feel that, and we're going to talk about that this morning. We feel like he's, he, we, 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 we cross a certain line and he begins to push us away. But that is not in the heart of Christ. That the heart of Jesus is wonderful. And these, mis these misconceptions are, are some of the reasons why people have rejected faith in Christ. And it's also why some people are bored with Jesus. We talk about Christ like he's a piece of sandpaper. That he's flat and he's unexciting. But Jesus, Jesus is incredibly, is incredibly gracious and real. And you and I can walk with him and we can experience his goodness. So this morning, Hebrews chapter 4. The more we drill down here, the richer our walk with Christ will be. Let me invite you to stand with me as we, as we look at the word. Hebrews chapter 4. Beginning in verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we were, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to give gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Let's pray together. Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we're so thankful for the fact that the freedom, the opportunity we have to worship you. God, we're grateful that you have spoken to us through your word. Lord, that we can, that we, we can know you in a real relationship. God, that you really save our souls. You really transform our lives. Because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross and in his resurrection, Lord, I pray this morning that as we look at this word, as we look at this passage of scripture, God, I pray that it would encourage us God, I pray that it would build our trust, build our faith in Jesus. God, that we would, as we walk away from this place this morning, God, we would know just how sympathetic and sacrificial you are towards us. That, God, you understand every failure, every weakness, every amount of suffering, every situation. God, there is nothing that we go through that you are not sympathetic to. Nothing we go through that you're unaware of. Nothing that we go through that you don't care about. Lord, you love us in a way that we can only begin to comprehend and yet not fully know. So, Lord, I pray that as we look at your word, God, you would take your word and you'd you'd press it into our hearts and our minds, God, and that you would let us see you more clearly. Let us understand who you are and your heart towards us. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so we get to we get to Hebrews chapter four, and in Hebrews chapter four, really, there is something that we're being invited to. Hebrews chapter four is really an invitation, and we'll and we'll talk about that invitation here in a few moments. But that invitation, if we could sum it up very quickly, it, very succinctly, it would be this: that we can boldly go to Jesus and receive His help and mercy. That we can boldly with confidence go to Christ in faith, whatever you're facing. And you can find mercy for your soul. You can find help for your situation wherever you are in your walk, in your life, whatever season that you find yourself in today. Whether this morning you're here and everything in life is going well or you're here and you're barely hanging on by a thread. Wherever you are, you can boldly Go to Jesus and you can receive his mercy and help. It's for you. Every one of you. Every one of us, individually, personally, that the mercy and help of Jesus is available to us. Now, this morning we, we're, we're looking, as we look at the heart of Jesus, there is something about Jesus that is true and yet we often don't talk about. We often don't think about Jesus in these ways. If I were to tell you, if I were to ask you to give me a word that describes or a title that describes Jesus and what he does, we would say things like, well, he's Lord, he's powerful, he's a savior. We would say that he's loving. We could could give all of these these descriptors, but one title, one thing here that that scripture really talks about and and we don't talk about enough is that Jesus is a high priest. Now, when I say he's a high priest, no one in here gets super excited about it. And here's why. Because that's so foreign to us, we don't talk like that. When we talk about Jesus, we don't think in terms of a high priest. We don't use that language. I mean, how often have you ever used the word priest in a conversation? Probably, unless you're group Catholic, probably not a whole lot, right? And that's that's so foreign and and it's so... Um, distant to us. But, um, but here's, here's what we're going to see this morning, is this is so wonderfully good for our relationship with God, that 
that if we understand that Jesus is a high priest, it's going to change some things, I believe, about how we go to him in times of need, in times of struggle, in times of sin, in times of suffering. I think that if we see him as a high priest, like the Bible tells us, then, then we will be comforted. You know, our world is so broken with sin and suffering. And yet, the wonderfully good news is that in Jesus, because he's the high priest in him, we find what we need. So, it, when I say the words high priest, you're probably thinking to yourself, what in the world are you talking about? What are you talking, what are you, what is this language of high priest? What's the, what's the big deal? Is this really that big of a deal? And, and the answer is yes, it's a huge deal. I'm glad you asked that question. That in the Old Testament, they, among the Jewish people, they had a man appointed to represent God to them as he taught them the law, and then, and then he represented the people before God. So what he would do is he would go and he would make sacrifices. Every day he'd be, he'd be in the temple. He'd be, he'd be opening up the Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. He'd be teaching from the, the Torah, the Torah, the law. He's in there explaining some things to the people every day, and he makes sacrifices on behalf of the people. Now, also what he does is, or what we see about the high priest, is that the high priest is a foreshadowing, it's a, a picture of who Jesus has come to be for us. So it, when you read the book of Hebrews, by the way, the book of Hebrews, if you like the Old Testament, if you, if you, if you like to see um, how the Old Testament connects to the New Testament, how it's really one big story. The Bible is not a bunch of little small stories. The Bible is one overarching story written over 1,500 years by, 40, by more than 40 different authors in three different languages on three different continents. It's one big overarching story of God's grace in salvation for us. And so if you like Old Testament connection, New Testament, read the book of Hebrews. Okay, it, the, the New Testament in Hebrews is full of, 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 of these images of the Old Testament. So, so listen to how Hebrews talks about Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, talking about Jesus says this, Therefore he, Christ, had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. To make propitiation. Now again, a word you're probably not familiar with, and that's okay, we'll explain it in a moment. To make propitiation for the sins of the people, for, he, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Here's the backstory: Jesus is in heaven with the Father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in heaven. He comes on a rescue mission for us. He leaves his place in heaven. He comes to earth, and he, he comes, and one job he takes, he, yes, he comes as Savior, but one job he, he takes is the job of high priest. And here's, he, he does two things for us. The first thing is this. Jesus Christ sacrifices for you. Now, when you woke up this morning and you thought, hey, we're, we're coming to church, we're going to worship, we're going to be in the Bible, we're going to be talking about the heart of Jesus, again, you probably didn't think about the fact that he is a high priest. But I'm telling you, this is wonderfully good news for every single person here today. He comes to, and he sacrifices for you. Hebrews 5.1 says this, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. So Jesus has come, one role, one office he takes, one job he assumes is that he comes to represent us in making a sacrifice for our sin. That's part of the high priest's job, okay? It's to pay or to atone or to propitiate, which is a fancy word to say, to appease the cost, to pay the cost, to appease the wrath or judgment for sin, Jesus comes to make a sacrifice. Now, the reason he does that is because sin is destructive. Sin bankrupts your life and my life physically, mentally, 
emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually. Sin, when, it, when sin seeps into something, it, it ruins, it corrupts, it tarnishes. It, can, you know, it, it, it destroys marriages and families, mental well-being. That sin is corrosive. It's infectious. It's a virus, right? And so, so it's a big deal, and it brings about judgment. And so on the, oh, there's a particular holy day on the Jewish calendar called Yom Kippur. Y'all may, have ever, y'all may have heard of that, Yom Kippur. It's otherwise known as the Day of Atonement. That's one time a year where the high priest, this man appointed to go and represent the people before God, he would go into the most holy room inside the temple, and there he would take a sacrificial animal. And on that animal, he would, he would, he would, he would lay his hands on that animal and symbolically transfer the sin of the whole nation onto this scapegoat. That's where the word comes from, scapegoat. You ever use that word? I'm sure you have. Get in trouble at work? Oh, my fault. It was their fault. They, they left the copy machine go. Like, like scapegoat, right? So, so you, you push the blame somewhere else. Well, so that's what they were doing with, with, with a sacrificial animal. The pride priest would come in, and he would lay his hands on this animal, and, he, and he, they would symbolically transfer the sin of the nation onto this animal, and its blood would be shed. It would die to atone or pay for the judgment. Uh, that sin brings on. It happened every year. Every year, the high priest would come and do this. One time, th- this, this big national cleansing, he would come in and he would take this animal and, and, he, and it, it would be slain as a temporary sin bearer. Okay? It was temporary. And so, Jesus has come to do away with the fact that we don't have to continue to make sacrifices for our sin, Jesus has come not to, not, to, not to shed the blood of bulls and goats and lambs, but he has come to sacrifice himself once and for all. You see, the, the high priest comes and takes an animal, and he sacrifices it for his sin and everyone else's sin. Jesus comes not having any sin of his own. He comes to be our sacrifice that we don't have to keep going to God and keep trying to find ways to atone for all of our failures and mistakes and sins. That Jesus has come and he said, you know what? I, like, I know that you all did this ritualistic system. I know that you kept sacrificing animals, but the blood of these animals won't do it. You need perfect, innocent blood, and I've come to bring it. I don't know about y'all, but that's exactly what I need. Is somebody to step into my place in, in the light, in light of my sin. Hebrews 7 says this, For it was indeed fitting we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners. Not in proximity, but the fact that Jesus was perfect, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to sacrifice daily. In other words, he doesn't need us to make daily sacrifices for his own sin. He doesn't have any. Perfect. First for his own sin and then those for the people since he died, since he did this once and for all when he offered himself up. Jesus owes no debt. He comes to pay ours. So instead of Instead, he comes to sacrifice himself for us, the sinless son of God. John says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is that lamb. Jesus is the one who cleanses us, who redeems us, who forgives us, who restores us, who makes me a new creation in Christ. That I wake up every day new in Jesus. That who I was yesterday, dead and gone Forget about, forget about yesterday, what about today? Because of Christ and his sacrifice for our transgressions and sin. Lays down his life once and for all. That, so, so that when we see Jesus face to face, and by the way, we're all, one, we're all one day closer to seeing Jesus. We live our life with tunnel, with tunnel vision, and I just want to encourage you, hey, you're one step closer to eternity than you were yesterday. You're one step closer. And for some of us, that's frightening. But you know what? If we're in Christ, it doesn't have to be. 
one step closer to seeing our Savior day to day, day by day. I'm, one, I'm, inching, I'm inching that direction every day. We all are inching that direction. And when we see Jesus, we will only have grace. It'll only be salvation. There will be no condemnation. There will be no judgment. There will be be no scorn or shame or guilt. Why? He's our high priest. He's our high priest. He has laid down his life for us. He has laid down his life for us. Dying in our place. We have friendship with God. Forgiveness purchased by his own innocent blood. A king laying down his life for a criminal. That he's not come to offer a sacrifice. Jesus came to be a sacrifice. That our lives with God are marked not by failure, but by his love. That his wounds have paid our ransom. Past, present, and future sin, all paid for, covered underneath his blood. That we don't have to worry if God's going to kick us out of the family. We don't have to worry if, if God will cast me away and push me away. That he covers us with mercy because he is gentle and lowly in heart towards us. But there's more. So he comes to sacrifice. That's one job of the high priest. But he comes also to sympathize with us. Sympathize with us. I don't know about you, but when I'm feeling down and out and I want to throw myself a pity party, what I like to do is I want to bring other people in on my sorrow. I want to bring, I want to invite other people to my pity party. I want want other people to to see and and, and be with me in the midst of my discontentment or suffering or whatever it may be. Jesus sympathizes with us. That in our suffering, we're going to look at this in a moment, in our suffering, Jesus knows and he cares. Look at Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet without sin. Hebrews 2.18 says that because he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. You know, Jesus is brimming to the top. of uh, he's, he's overflowing out of his heart with sympathy for you and me. Why? Because he has experienced the very kinds of trouble and temptation that we experience. You know, often in conversation, we say things like this. And I think we do it well-intentioned to try to get our point across about how bad things are. But we say things like this. Well, you don't know what I've been through. You've never walked a mile in my shoes. And that may be true. I may not know, or you may not know what I've gone through, or I may not know exactly what you're going through, the particular details of your circumstance. I may not know those things. But here's what is true. While I may not know them exactly, Jesus does. He's walked the road that you're walking, and he's he's walked it perfectly. He knows real temptation and real suffering, and he's never given in. He's never sinned. He has faced the full gamut of human experience. He has felt all the highs that we experience. He has felt the lows that we experience. And he did this so that when we suffer, that God in heaven would be able to sympathize with us in order to help us, in order to guide us, in order to care for us our experiences, our suffering, our weaknesses. He knows exactly what you're going through. He 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 has walked this same road. And right now in heaven, his heart is still for you. He is still sympathetic, tender towards you. That as, as he sits... As Christ sits on the command center of the world, as he sits over the universe, he sees us and and he sees the experiences that we go through and he's gone through the very same and his heart overflows with sympathy, with pity, with compassion for us. 
that Hebrews 4 and 5 ought to strip away some of the harsh things that we think about God. We ought to see the sympathetic heart of Jesus here. His tenderness, his patience, his love. He is not unable to sympathize with you. He knows exactly what you're going through. Exactly. So, so there are two areas in which that's true. The first is that Jesus is tender towards your failure. He is tender towards your failure. We see that in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2. I love Hebrews 5, 2. What an encouraging verse this is going to be right here for us. Hebrews 5, 2 says this. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. What, is, what does the ignorant mean? That is sin by accident. Okay, so in other words, this is not a perfect analogy, but let's just go with it here. Let's say you get a speeding ticket, but you honestly didn't know what the speed limit was. Are you guilty of breaking the speed limit? Yes. Was it an honest mistake? Yes. You genuinely didn't know what the limitation was. That's ignorance. The wayward is sin on purpose. You knew the speed limit was 35 in Bainberry. You knew it was 35. And you thought because you were so young and you were in a fast car that you could double it to 70. And you hit 63 before you got caught. You know what that is? Purposeful rebellion. Okay? We won't talk about who that was. But in any situation, in any situation, whether it's out of ignorance or out of purpose, it's waywardness, intention. If you belong to Jesus, you, you know how he deals with you. Either way, gently, gently. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. Gently. Why does he have such compassion? Why? Sometimes, you know, when, some, when, you're, when you're in a pickle or you're in a, you're, in a, you're in a harsh spot and someone's like killing you with kindness, so to speak, they're so compassionate. You're like, why are you so nice? Like, leave, like, get angry or something. And so that way you can be justified in getting angry back, right? Like, we go, what's happening here? Why would Jesus be so merciful? Why? He knows what I'm going through. He sees me making a mess of things, and like, he is compassionate. Why? Because he knows the power and the allure of temptation. He knows it firsthand. He knows that life comes at us quickly, and we just do dumb things. He was tempted. He remained sinless. He could have looked down his nose and been like, you know what? Not worthy to save. Not coming after you. No thank you. Not interested. The whole human race condemned. He could have looked down his nose and pointed his finger and been like, you know what? Let's, let's hit the reset button. And he doesn't do that. Jesus has run the same race. He's walked the same path. I mean, for crying out loud, if we think about the life of Jesus, I mean, here he is, before, as he starts his earthly ministry, before he preaches his first sermon, he goes out to the wilderness, and he's out there for 40 days praying and fasting. Now, I know some of you spiritual, real spiritual people have prayed and fasted for 40 days, just like Jesus, okay? Well, if you, if you do that, depending on what you've, what you've done in your fasting, you're, you're, the temptation is to get really hungry. He's out for 40 days alone, alone. He didn't, have a, he didn't have a prayer partner or a fasting partner. It was him and the Father. He's out in the wilderness, and he's praying and fasting for 40 days. Satan himself shows up in the wilderness. And he knows that Jesus is hungry. And he offers Jesus a set of compromises, a set of temptations. He says, hey, Jesus. Probably whispers to him, hey, Jesus. Just like he did to Adam and Eve. Hey, Jesus. Hey. Um, I know you're real hungry. You've been out here for a long time. Um, you know, if you're the son of God, what you could do is, see all these rocks right here? You can turn those into bread and eat them 
and, and get rid of this hunger. Jesus, knowing this is a trap, didn't fall for it. But if that was you and I fasting 40 days in the wilderness, hungry like that, we'd have been like, mm, sourdough, pita, whole wheat bread, uh, boom. That's what we would have done. We'd have been like, all right, pumpernickel, boom, put it on the list. Like, we'd have, we'd have, just, we'd have just given in. Olive Garden, chop house bread, put the butter on. Like, y'all would have been there. Don't look at me. Y'all would have been there, okay? That, that, hey, that's all of us in the room doing that. But Jesus didn't do that. But he knows the power of it. He knows the allure. The t he knows the, 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 the drawing force of temptation. He knows it. And he said, he resisted because he's perfect, but he knows that we struggle. And, he, and you know what he has? Sympathy, mercy, tenderness, that he sees all that we go through. And he goes, man, I love you so much. I move with pity and compassion. I just see your situation, and it's just, it's, you're being barraged every day. It's a barrage of temptation. He sees it. And, 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 and he, his heart is not to push away from you. It's to draw closer to you. The Puritan Thomas Goodwin said this, Your sins move Jesus to pity, not anger. He loves us so much and he hates how sin destroys us that he, he's moved with gentleness towards us. Even his discipline is loving and good. I mean, you can't, it, it, you can't get away from the goodness of Jesus. When we are rolling around in the dirt and we're making a mess, the floodgates of the heart of God are opened up with gentleness and compassion. That the dam, the levee breaks and sympathy comes pouring out. And that's so foreign to us because when some, we see somebody else flailing around, we get angry. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, why? Stop it. Quit. Like, that, that's us. Those snap judgment reactions. But that's because we're not, we're, we're not God. We don't have the capacity of patience. We don't have the, the same capacity of compassion that Jesus does. That he is so tender to us in our weakness. But also our, our, our failure. But also, Jesus is tender towards your suffering. Sometimes you, you ask the question, does God really care? I mean, does God really care that I, that I am hurting so bad? Does God really care that I'm sick? Does God really care that I'm grieving of the loss of a loved one? Does God really care about how there are broken things fracturing all around me? Does God really even care? Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet without sin. We keep repeating that word sympathy. You know what the word sympathy means? It doesn't just mean that he knows, he knows um, and, and he feels bad for you. It's more powerful than that. That word sympathy in Greek actually means that he co-suffers alongside of you. He feels it with you. That when you're going through something, he goes through it with you. Why? Because you are united to him by faith inseparable from his love. So when you put your faith in Jesus, you are brought together in, I would say, holy matrimony, if you will, spiritually speaking, and you are, you are united to him. And so when you hurt, he feels it in his own heart. In his own heart. He doesn't just know what you're going through. He feels what you're going through. Sympathy. That's exactly what that word means in Greek. He co-suffers with you. When I'm suffering, he is hurting. His heart hurts as well. He feels every hardship. He feels every trial. He feels every struggle you have because he's emotionally attached to you. So because he suffered like we suffered, he knows. He feels. He's been through it all and more. I love this quote. I recommended a book a couple weeks ago from Dane Ortland called Gentle and Lowly. And I love this quote from that book. Jesus is not Zeus. Zeus being Greek god of mythology. Jesus is not Zeus. He was not a sinless man. He was a sinless man, not a sinless superman. He woke up with bedhead. 
He had pimples at 13. He never would have appeared on the cover of Men's Health because Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, 2, he had no beauty that we would desire him. He came as a normal man to normal men. He knows what it's like to be thirsty, hungry, despised, rejected, scorned, shamed, embarrassed, abandoned, misunderstood, falsely accused, suffocated, tortured, and killed. He knows what it's like to be lonely. His friends abandoned him when, they needed, when he needed them the most. Had he lived today, every last Twitter follower and Facebook friend would have unfriended him when he turned 33. He who will never unfriend us. But every mile you've ever walked, Jesus has walked every inch of that same mile. And he's walked some miles you'll never walk. Because you are united to him by faith, when you, when you suffer, he suffers. He knows what you're going through. Lost a loved one? Jesus wept when Lazarus, who, whom he considered his own brother, passed away. Rejected by family and friends? His own half-siblings thought he was mentally insane for the miracles he was doing. And for, call, and for referring himself as the Son of God. Have you ever been betrayed by somebody that you were close to? Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. You know what that is in today's currency? Two to four hundred dollars. Judas betrayed the Son of God for maybe 400 bucks. Are you physically suffering this morning? He was, Jesus was spit on, he was, bitten, he, was, he was beaten, he was whipped with his own flesh being torn off his back. Are you on the verge of death? Maybe, you're, maybe it's, it's like an end of life situation. He knows what death is like too. On the cross when the sky went dark and the ground beneath the cross shook and everyone in all of creation felt that, that, that grand earthquake. The moment that Jesus died, he knows what death is like too. Sympathy. He suffers alongside of us because he suffered for us. His heart goes out to you in, in your pain and in your sickness, in your betrayals, in your losses, when you are broke or slandered, or confused. He feels it. He knows your weakness, and he knows your pain. He's taken us into his heart. He knows, and he suffers with you. On the road to Damascus, in the book of Acts chapter 9, Saul, who we know as the Apostle Paul, before he became a Christian, Saul was a murderer of Christians. He was a religious leader, he was a persecutor of the church. And in chapter 8, there was a man named Stephen, one of the earliest Christians. And Saul stood there and gave the thumbs up to his execution. He's a Christian. We've got to kill him. Gives the thumbs up. Saul is walking to a place called Damascus. Jesus confronts Saul on the road and says this to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Wait a second. No, 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 no. Jesus, you got it wrong, Jesus. Saul said that Stephen could be killed. Jesus is in heaven on the throne. And Jesus on the throne in heaven yet says, why are you persecuting me? Why would Jesus say that? Because he is united to you. And when the church suffers, when we suffer, he feels it and he suffers too. That he is so full of mercy and so full of kindness that he, that he, is, he is, as we say, bending over backwards. He is, he, is over, he is overreaching to try to help you through whatever it is you're going through. So when you're down and out, He's right there with you. He knows. He knows. He's present. He's not forgot about you. He's not abandoned you. He's with you. He feels it also. That is incredible grace. 
But what do we do with the sacrificial heart of Jesus? What do we do with the sympathetic heart of Jesus? When his heart is bursting, is at the is bursting at the seams with compassion and sympathy. What do we do? Don't stop trusting Jesus. When temptation or when sin or, or, or sin or suffering come knocking at your door, do not stop trusting Jesus. Don't quit. Keep trusting him. Hebrews 4.14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Flowing out from the heart of Jesus, he's done everything for you. Your salvation accomplished. Redemption accomplished. Forgiveness accomplished. Grace accomplished. It's yours freely because of what he's done for us. We're new. Our lives are in his hands. Don't quit. When you're suffering or you're tempted, don't abandon ship. Don't jump overboard. Don't walk away from him. That's the temptation. You know, I, I, had, I, I had faith in God. This bad thing happened. I'm out. Don't walk away. The Christians here in Hebrews are being tempted to walk away. And, 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 the, and the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, don't do it because Jesus is better than any other alternative you'll possibly find. He's better than every bottle you can drink, every pill you can take, all the sex you can imagine, all the money you can get, all the fame and fortune that you can, you can, you can, you can wrap up for yourself. He is better. Don't walk away. Hold fast. You're going, I feel so weak. I can't hold fast. Good news, he's holding on to you. John 10, 28 says that no one can snatch you out of my hand. If you belong to him, he's got you forever. So you know what we can do? We're freed up to go, you know what? I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Love is a stronger motivation than guilt or, 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 or fear. And if we get his heart right, if we see his sympathy and his compassion and his sacrifice, if we see it, we'll be drawn to this great love. Keep trusting, keep believing. God will strengthen you. He will strengthen you. That's a promise. He will strengthen you. Don't give up. Keep pressing forward. And by not your strength, but by his strength, you'll take one foot and you'll put it in front of the other day by day and you'll just walk with him. And you'll look back and you'll go, man, I don't, know how, I don't know what I did to make it through this situation. I didn't do anything. Jesus did it all. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep trusting him. And lastly, come to him for help and mercy. It's one thing not to give up, but it's another thing to continually run into the arms of Jesus. That's, I mean, he's invited continually running into the arms of Jesus. Look at help and mercy. Look at verse uh, 16, chapter 4, verse 16. I love this verse too. Mm. Let us then with confidence, boldness, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In 1985, the AP, Associated Press, ran a story there was a 13-year-old girl in New York, and she sold 25,000 boxes of Girl Scout cookies. 25,000 boxes of Girl Scout cookies. What, $2 a box? It's like 50 grand. You know, I mean, that's I mean, that's 13-year-old girl, pretty impressive. And it made national news, this, this young girl, made national news. And she was interviewed, they were trying to figure out like what her tips to business success were. How did she sell by herself 25,000 boxes of Girl Scout cookies out from like a Walmart or a Piggly Wiggly? I mean, like, like, uh, how, like there's, no, there's no manufacturing scheme or plant or like support staff. It was just her. 
And they're trying to figure out like what she did to be so successful. And she was asked about what do you how do you deal with people, especially if they try to if they try to like get around you and avoid you so that, so they don't have to tell you no to your face? Like what like like you see somebody and they're walking like the long way around and you're going, all right, they're trying. They 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 see my table, they see these cookies here. Like what do you what did you do? And here's what she said. She said that her mom taught her this. I look them right in the eye and I make them feel guilty. I look them right in the eye and make them feel guilty. Now that is pretty funny. Now, but that is not what Jesus does to us. In our failure and in our suffering, he does not look us in the eye to make us feel guilty. Because if he did, we wouldn't go to him. You know what we would do if he did that to us? We would run and hide in fear. God is not interested in pulverizing you into the dirt. He does not want you to run and hide from him in the lowest and weakest, weakest moments of your life. He, our weakness and our hardship weigh on us so much already. He knows the burden, and Jesus is not interested in burdening you even more. We want to throw the towel in anyway. And yet he wants us to come to him and to look him in the eye and to see how much grace there is in the heart of God. Because if we don't believe that he's sacrificial and sympathetic towards us, merciful and helpful, we will not draw near to him in our moments where we need him the most. But when you're suffering, when you're sinning, when you're, uh, when you're somewhere in between, you're, you, you, you don't even know where you are, or you can't make sense of what you're doing, draw near to Jesus. He is inviting us, come to the throne of grace. Keep knocking on the door. Keep coming. Don't stop. He's got a soft spot in his heart for what you're going through. He, Jesus does not look down and say, oh no, this is a waste of time. He does not have buyer's remorse when it comes to you and your situation. He, he does not have regrets of going to the cross for you. You can go to him with confidence, boldness. Why? Because he has secured my relationship with God through the, his death on the cross and his resurrection. I can go confidently. I don't have to wonder. I, I'm, I'm hurting like, like should, I mean, can I, can, I, can, I, can I pray about it? Like, I don't, can I pray? Like what, like, what do I, like, I don't have to wonder. I can say, Lord, I need you right now. We can go confidently because he has made grace ready and free and available for us. It's a throne of grace, not a throne of shame, not a throne of scorn and mocking and belittling. It's a throne of grace. And he's saying, listen, you're sinning or suffering, come to me. Keep coming. D don't give up. You can come to me. There's a father in the story, in the gospel of Mark. It's really, I think, in all the gospels, but in the gospel of Mark, chapter 9, a dad, his son, is possessed by a demon and is trying to drown himself. And when that doesn't work, he throws himself into the fire, into a fire to burn his body. And if you have ever had a sick child, I would imagine, critically ill child maybe, um, you know that as a parent, you, you only can do so much. You know, when it, you know you're... Maybe you have, you have a newborn, and that newborn's in the NICU, and, 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 and you want to you wanna hold, you, you hold your child, and you can't, but you can't get in there, you can't do it, you can't hold them, and you can't fix what, you can't soothe what's hurting them, and you know there's something wrong, and as a parent, you feel so limited and desperate, and you go, man, I want to do something, but I can't do anything. That's where this father is with, with his son. He goes to Jesus, and he says, hey, can you help us? That's the question. Can you help us? And Jesus says, yes, I can. That word for help that he used to ask Jesus for help is the same word right here. If you are hurting, if you are 
needing the Lord to intervene, if you are desperate and you're in a situation and you don't know what to do, you're lacking wisdom, or, and, and there's pain and there's problem and you don't know what's going on, if you go to Jesus, he can't help you. He can sustain you and strengthen you. That doesn't mean he'll remove the problem, but that means he will see you through whatever it is you're going through. Because God's answers to our different solution, our different problems are, 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 are not, they're not cookie cutter. But the ultimate answer is the cross and resurrection of Jesus. That if you are in sin, he can pull you out of sin. If, you're, if, you're in, if, you, if, you, if, your, if your problem is addiction, go to Jesus. If your problem is anger or jealousy, go to Jesus. If you're, if you're wrestling with depression, go to Jesus. If you're experiencing physical pain and discomfort, go to Jesus. That he suffered in every way like us, he, and he's conquered whatever it is, you're, whatever it is you're, you're, you're wrestling and facing through the cross and resurrection. A, a, a dear lady at a church I served with had passed away, and her son, um, she was an elder lady, and her son was probably in his 50s. He texted me and said, hey, mom has passed, you know, cancer, cancer got her. And I, and I, I remember, uh, I, I don't, it wasn't a conscious thing. I don't, I don't know what happened, but in that moment, I responded. And I, texted, I texted him back and I said, you know, I, I'm so sorry to hear that. But the cross and resurrection of Jesus has served an eviction notice to cancer. That one day, that, that it, it, it still may get us yet, but... There, that there's coming a day where there will be no more sickness or sin. That, that he'll wipe away every tear from your eyes. And there will be nothing but grace and mercy and perfection in the presence of Jesus. So whatever it is you're going through, we have a great high priest. Full of power and mercy and sympathy. So at the first sign of trouble, let's go to Jesus. Let's draw near through worship, the word, prayer. Let's run to Jesus. If you will go to him, you will find his help and his mercy. So we're going to do that right now. Let me invite you to stand with me. As our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, we come to this moment of responding to the Lord. We have wonderful news this morning. The heart of Jesus is sacrificial and sympathetic, full of mercy and help. And the best part is it is for you right now. It's for you right now. And if you're here this morning, you're saying, you know what, I don't know, I've never put my faith in Jesus. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't belong to him. I've never repented, I've never believed in the cross and resurrection to save me, then why don't you come to Jesus today and he will save you. Because he lived perfectly. He died sacrificially on the cross in your place. He rose again three days later from the grave. He freely offers forgiveness. He can save you. He can change your life. If you're here this morning and you're saying, you know what, I'm a believer in Christ. My faith is in Jesus. When you sin, don't walk away. Don't hide. When you're suffering, don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Keep going to Jesus and you will find all of the mercy and help that you need in him so let's embrace him in this time of invitation in, in, in the time of our, of our greatest and, and deepest need let's go to him and he will meet you there amazing grace what an amazing savior 
If you don't know him, you can come to know him today. We would love to pray with you next to the screen. If you're saying, you know what, I'm a believer, I've never been baptized, we would love to, we'd love to talk with you about that, taking the next step in your faith. And you're, if, you're, if you're here this morning, you're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm suffering and I'm in need. Then this altar is open if you want to come and have somebody pray with you. If you'd like to come by yourself, whatever it is God's calling on your heart to do right now, would you respond to him? Father, we just come before you, Lord. God, we say thank you that Jesus is our high priest. God, that you have sacrificed for us. God, that you sympathize, you feel our suffering alongside of us. God, there is no amount of sin or suffering that will separate your people from your heart. None. We belong to you. We're united to you. God, and for those who don't know you, when they come to know you this morning and they give their life to Jesus. Lord, and for those of us who, who do know you, may we just, may we continually run to you, knowing that you will never cast us away, that your arms are forever open. You want us to come. So God, we pray in these next few moments you would have your way. As we sing and as we respond, God, have your way in our hearts. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in the darkness, 
our God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That's who you are. God, that we have tasted and seen your goodness. God displayed, love displayed on the cross. Hope in an, out from an empty tomb. God, there's mercy, there's help. Spring forth from the heart of Jesus. So God, we just are amazed at your goodness towards us. May we not forget it. God, may we, may we embrace it and run to you and be refreshed by it. God, would you draw us deeper because of it. That we would know you more and more, more intimately, more personally. That we would be satisfied and joyful changed. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, let me just say, I'm glad on this Daylight Saving Sunday to see you guys this morning. So I have a couple of announcements uh, for us before we, before we pray and sing and dismiss. Um, number one, just to remind you again of the offering. Uh, our offerings are on, on the walls. You, you, you got three drop boxes back there. We have a basket up here. You can give it freedomwatpond.org forward slash give. Thank you for your, fa your continued faithfulness. Um, also, this upcoming Wednesday evening, there will be no kids, youth, or adult Bible study. It's a uh, spring break for the school system, and so we'll, uh, we're going to take that. We're going to take that this Wednesday off completely and uh, recharge the batteries, so to speak, and get and gear up and get ready for. Uh, the next couple of weeks as we approach Easter together. Uh, so, with that said, though, next Sunday we're having a fellowship meal immediately following service. Now, the only thing you're required to bring is, number one, a smile. I hope you, I hope you come happy. I hope you come hungry, okay? And then also, but seriously, a dessert or, or a side. That would be great. Uh, we'll have it set up uh, down, down in the gym area. And that'd be a wonderful time of fellowship. Um, it would just our campus, White Pond. Uh, we're we're going to get together. We're going we're to also use that opportunity to pack some outreach bags for Easter. So we're going to eat, hang out, pack a few bags, uh, and enjoy uh, what God has in store for us there. So that's next Sunday, following the service. Bring a side or dessert, uh, and I'll be, I'll post that this week, multiple places, uh, so you can see that on social media or however you follow along uh, online digitally, if you do. And if you don't, then I suggest write it down. <laughs> so, <laughs> personalized mail. Anyway, here we go. So, uh, okay. Also, real quick, um, immediately following service here in a few minutes, if you are a Freedom Kids volunteer Wednesday night or Sunday morning, or you are interested in, in serving kids, uh, we're going to have a meeting real quick. It'll be out in the coffee house. We'll have some finger foods. Uh, hopefully, we won't keep you too long, but we will have some snacks, uh, finger foods out there for you. And then we are going to address a few things, answer some questions maybe that you might have, and, uh, and continue to, to build towards uh, uh, what God has in store for Freedom Kids. So, anyway, all right. That will be, I think, enough for us today. <laughs> if nobody's told you, Jesus loves you. And we, and we do too. 
And we're glad you're here this morning. I'm glad you stand with me as we pray. Father, again, we thank you for this time of worship we've had. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, a word that is, that is always at work in our hearts. God, I pray that, uh, again, Lord, that all that we do, you would, just, you would just draw us closer to you. God, that we would walk with you. God, that you would guide us. Lord, that we would know your joy. God, we would, we would have your peace. Lord, that we could just, we would live in, 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 in freedom as free people in Christ. So, God, God, I thank you again for the gracious heart of Jesus and how inviting it is to us and how soul-saving and life-changing it is. Lord, may we embrace this week as we go back to work or school or out in our communities, wherever we are, hobbies, wherever we are, Lord, may you draw us closer to your own heart. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. You are way maker, miracle